Okay, I guess it's time to get started. This talk uh, will be about getting Linux distros to new architectures. And I'm going to uh, talk about how we did it in Open Mandriva, but obviously the same techniques will work for pretty much any other distribution, obviously with some modifications for package manager and so on. So, I think most of us will remember how we all started out. There was an x86 processor, boot process was clearly defined by BIOS and UEFI. Same bootloader, same kernel for all supported devices. All graphics cards and stuff uh, automatically identified because they were on PCI, PCIe, USB, or earlier AGP, ESA, PNP. ARM and MIPS and a couple of other architectures existed but just weren't generally powerful enough to run a PC distribution. They were only for embedded stuff and therefore putting a desktop or server distribution on them was just not something people would do. But things are getting much more interesting now. We have AX64 which is in anything from Raspberry Pi to high-end servers. We have RISC-V, which is an uh, open CPU architecture, and, uh, which is starting to get everywhere. We have Lung Arch from China and Elbrus from Russia, also to, uh, trying to become relevant. And of course, good Linux distributions sh should make an effort to be on everything. <laughs> so the first step must be to support processor architectures that are not x86. So there's an easy way to do it. Just take some other distribution that has already done it, boot it and recompile your own packages on top of it. And then uh, yeah, you're done, no cross compilers needed, nothing else that could be scary to someone who is only used to x86. But of course the downside of that is uh, someone else must have done the work already. So you will certainly not be the first, you will not be the second. And of course, if you don't trust the other distribution, maybe someone built in an exploit that, uh, that will move on to your distribution because it might be hidden in the compiler and things like that. So let's try to do it right and uh, not uh, build on someone else's work first. And first, we need tool chains, uh, which is the compilers and uh, bin utils and stuff like that to produce binaries for the target architecture. Now, LLVM and Clang are great at this because uh, usually they already have all the cross compilers built in. If you just have the regular x86 compiler, uh, you just tell it Clang dash target, whatever you want to target, and it will produce the binary for that architecture. But at least for now, uh, we are not at a point where you can build everything with Clang. For example, glibc is, uh, still requires only GCC, so we need the traditional toolchain as well. A lot of distributions already provide cross toolchain packages, uh, but many do it in a way that guarantees they will always be out of date. Uh, they are packaged separately, they use separate source files and separate patch files, are possibly maintained by someone else uh, than the, the core toolchain. So there must be a better way to get to them. Uh, what we are trying to do in Open Mandriva and what probably a few others are also doing, certainly the source-based distributions like uh, Yog2 are doing it. Uh, we try, uh, try to put, uh, keep everything in sync, uh, make sure the same patches are in place, make sure all the compilers are in sync, uh, make sure if we update the main compiler, it will also update all the cross-compilers. And fortunately that's not so hard to do. Uh, it's just a matter of editing the script that builds the package, uh, like the RPM spec file or the, its equivalent in the other package managers, to just build all the targets uh, at once, and then come up with a file list that uh, lists uh, what you need for the uh, target. And yeah, if you want to add another architecture for which we aren't building the cross tool chains yet, just add it to the targets variable in the example above. So now we have tool chains and next step is getting a small OS that can actually boot and uh, that is powerful enough to compile the rest of the packages natively. There's still a few things that won't cross compile. Uh, for example, if anyone has ever tried to cross compile LibreOffice, uh, you may still have some headaches. 
So uh, there's certainly things we would still like to do on the target system, given we are not really the, uh, targeting the uh, low-end embedded devices with this distribution. The, uh, that's something we can do. So in the next step, uh, we will build a small OS that, uh, that can boot and compile the rest of the packages. So what we need is something that boots and has compilers and make and ninja and those tools all available so you can build all the other packages. So first we get the package manager ready. This is a little specific to RPM, but I'm pretty sure other package managers have uh, similar bits. So RPM theoretically has support for cross-compiling built-in. You can say RPM build uh, dash BA, which means uh, build, and then you just give it a different target, and you pass it the RPM spec file, which is the build instructions. But unfortunately, out of the box, this doesn't work because RPM isn't set up to do cross-compiles. What you will get from RPM if you don't tweak it, and if you don't use the packages in Open and Reaver where we've already fixed this, so you will get packages that are marked as the target architecture, but that actually contain binaries for, for the host architecture, which is obviously not something that's going to work. So what you have to do is configure RPM to use the right compiler by modifying the RPM macros in the per platform directory. So for example, here we set CC, which is the compiler, this means uh, if the variable prefer GCC is set, uh, it will be set to a target platform GCC, which is the typical name of uh, GCC cross compilers. And if pre preferred GCC is not set, it will use Clang. Clang, uh, as I've uh, quickly mentioned before, uh, already has all the cross compilers built in, so the, uh, we just invoke the regular Clang compiler and give it dash target, target platform, which is again the RPM macro for the uh, platform as a parameter, and we also pass it to sysroot, which is essentially a change root environment for containing binaries for the target architecture. Yeah, and then we do the same for AR and a couple of other tools to, uh, that are related to it. And another macro I found to be quite useful is uh, this one, which is used to, to check whether or not we are cross-compiling, but just uh, compiling a minimal application that just returns zero and seeing if it can run. So this can be useful, for example, to disable profile guided optimizations and other stuff that will, uh, will not work while you're cross-compiling. Yeah, I've already quickly mentioned this roots as a change root environment for, that contains the binaries for, for the target platform. They are a bit special because they usually have a slightly different file system layout. So. If you've worked with this roots, you've probably seen user ARC64, the Linux slash lib and the likes, while regular packages would place the uh, library files in user lib. But if you just simlink dot to user uh, that make, uh, gets it close enough, the, then you have a slash lib and a slash include that works in a sysroot, uh, sysroot file system layout. So we can just use the packages we are building to populate the sysroot as well without even having to rebuild or move stuff around. Now, next thing is figuring out in what order to build the packages. We can just build all the packages we want because the, obviously they depend on some shared libraries that uh, will not yet be available in, uh, for the target system. So we have to find out the right order. And sooner or later, it gets a bit more problematic because, for example, a lot of core libraries like uh, libxml uh, want to build Python bindings in their packages, and therefore they need Python to exist before. But building Python requires those libraries to be present on the system. So we have a bit of a chicken and egg problem. And of course, uh, typical distributions also have dependencies between free type and half bus and the likes that go both ways. So that has to be sorted out. Fortunately, there are a couple of tricks to deal with this. For, uh, RPM, for, uh, for example, has this feature where you can enable uh, features optionally. 
in the spec file, you give it this macro bcont with, the bcont without, to, uh, which means build condition with and without. And then you can use RPM build uh, dash dash with or dash dash without to the, uh, enable or disable that first specific feature. That's not co commonly used in distribution packages these days because the, yeah, the uh, distributions will just ship a binary package so, uh, so you don't get to pick between different feature sets. But it is very useful for creating the bootstrapping packages uh, even in this use case. So once we modify all the packages that have circular dependencies to optionalize those features, like uh, modifying free type to not need, uh, need half bars and the likes where if a special condition is given, uh, we can do that and build the packages in that new order. And then later on, when the rest is there, rebuild them again uh, without the special tricks. So now uh, that all the packages have been modified to, uh, to not have circular dependencies, we can just uh, go ahead, build the core packages with the right uh, build conditions uh, set. We have a script uh, that does this for Open and Reval. Uh, I've put the link here instead of showing the entire thing. So the, um, if you want to take a look at uh, what order we are building packages in, what particular f uh, features we are disabling, you can just uh, go there. Uh, we probably won't have the time to go over this today. And an interesting fun fact, uh, our fastest build machine is actually an Ampere Ultra, which is an ARC64 machine. So uh, in bootstrapping our RISC-V port, there was actually no x86 machine involved at all. N of course, now that we have this thing the, where we can uh, build the core package uh, set and compilers for every architecture, it also makes sense to, to go beyond just CPU architectures and also look at different ABIs. For example, the, uh, there's a couple of different libcs that might be interesting. And obviously, if you're building a desktop distribution, uh, you usually want to use glibc to be binary compatible uh, with the other distributions to get stuff like Steam and other non-free stuff to, uh, to just work on your system. But if you're trying to build something smaller and you know you don't need to run any proprietary stuff, there's muscle, you see libc, and those can, uh, also have advantages like being smaller, being faster for some stuff. And, you know, of course, uh, changing the libc requires pretty much the same the features as uh, you need when targeting a new architecture. You also need to build all the packages in order. You need to resolve the circular dependencies. So we thought it would be a good idea to just do that from the same script. So it accepts not just targets like RISC-V64 Linux or Lung Arch Linux or whatever, but it also accepts uh, alternative libc as a, as a part of the ta target triple. So for example, if you give a tell the script to build something for RISC-V64 OpenMentreval Linux muscle instead of OpenMentreval Linux GNU, it will do that and use muscle for the new system. So. Now that that's done, can we finally declare victory? What we have now is all the packages we need. And, uh, if we have a proper QEMU setup on the box, we can change root into the sys root and verify everything is working. But unfortunately, we forgot some minor detail, which is booting. What we did traditionally to boot the system is uh, built an ISO 9660 CD file system that typically has a floppy disk image embedded with, uh, that contains the bootloader. Obviously, that's not going to work for machines that have newer architectures that have ne never been designed with floppy disks or even CDs in mind. <laughs> UEFI is common on those new architectures, but uh, it's still not built into everything. And there's no such thing as a standard boot process. Bootloaders and mandatory partition layouts can differ greatly between devices even of the same architecture. For example, if you've ever tried to 
build a Linux system for Raspberry Pi, and then you've tried to get the same system to boot on a rock chip board like an Orange Pi or so, you will run into this. Yeah, you will essentially use the same binaries, but the kernel is different, the bootloader is different, so we need to fix this as well. Now, unfortunately, SOC makers are not very good at working with upstream, so many devices even require custom kernels. So the kernel package for, from your favorite distribution is unlikely to work completely on the, most of the boards for, for newer architectures. And of course, we might also be trying to build something that is not actually something that boots on real hardware, but as a Docker container instead of a hardware image or so, in which case we can omit the kernel, but otherwise we still want to use the same binary packages. So doing that all from one place still makes sense. So this is the time to look at the solutions people have already come up with in the completely source-based distributions like Yocto that were meant to support as many boards as possible from the start. What they do right is support for different bootloaders, supporting per device kernels, different partition layouts, file systems, picking different package sets, possibly some more customizations. And let's see the, how we can do the same thing in a binary package world. We've come up with OS Image Builder, which again, I'm providing as a link instead of the, showing the entire script uh, because of time restrictions. And there we have simple configuration options uh, to configure custom kernels, hardware-specific packages, kernel command line additions, U-boot repositories, or builders for alternative bootloaders. N what we also think is useful is the possibility to overload key parts of the build script. So for example, partitioning, file system creation can be delegated to different scripts. InitRamFS, boot image creation, generic post-processing. Now obviously now the, after implementing all those, the, we run into a situation where you'd have to copy around a lot of things to target bots that are really similar. For example, if you have a Raspberry Pi 2 and a Pi 3 and a Pi 4 and a Pi 5, you generally need the same configurations for a bootloader and possibly the same kernel as well. So we decided to also make it possible for one device to inherit another. So we have a generic Raspberry Pi thing and then uh, Pi 4, Pi 5, and so on, on top of it, that inherit this uh, generic file and uh, just add the bot specific bits on top of it. This is uh, what the bot config file needs to contain. First line is obviously the CPU architecture uh, that will always have to be known. The next line is extra packages that need to be installed. After that, the special thing, the extra packages that need to be installed for the hardware only if a GUI is requested. Then the, where the kernel comes from, this can be either the package, uh, then the binary kernel is used, or URL to a Git repository. And if we are using a source-based kernel, uh, we can specify the configuration that's uh, going to be used and additional config options that are not part of the BCM2711 dev config in this particular uh, example. Then we can set whether the kernel is uh, built with GCC or Clang. We set the device tree file, command line options. In this particular case, we don't need to build an initRD or initRamFS, so we skip that. Yeah, and that is sufficient to uh, get the board config up for Raspberry Pi in this example. Next thing, obviously, if we are building such an image builder that has all those features, we also want it to be able to build customized images for different purposes, like um, in a Docker image that will run a web server or so, you need a completely different package set from uh, booting a desktop where you will be doing your office work. So 
there's command line options to, uh, to set package sets and extra packages. And package lists are essentially just a text file uh, listing all the packages that are needed to uh, be installed. But to make it more interesting, we, uh, we run them through a C pre uh, preprocessor. So you can include other package sets or even uh, add checks, like if some other package set is being installed, uh, install this package, and if not, install that package. So for example, if you want to support multiple desktops, you can pull in the Qt integration for LibreOffice uh, when you're using KDE or LXQT, and the GTK integration if you're using GNOME or uh, one of those desktops. Yeah. So that's where we are now. If anyone has questions or suggestions or bags of dog food, we, uh, we have time for some questions. Or find me later, I'll also be here for LPC. Or you can join us on Matrix or send me an email. Given we have some time, if you want, we can also lay, uh, take a look at the source of the scripts. Or is, uh, is there anything else? Are there any questions? Yeah. I hope that's uh, not completely irrelevant. Thanks for the talk, by the way. And uh, I was wondering, the Risk Five platform it doesn't have several variations like what's included, like floating point. Does that make any difference in the whole process that you have just described? For the process, it doesn't make much of a difference, but obviously it makes things more interesting in that uh, a binary uh, package that you build for one uh, risk 5 bot will not necessarily run on another. So it's just a matter of specifying the right co configuration options in the tool chain, uh, making sure you don't compile with dash m arch equals risk 5 f if you, uh, your target board doesn't have a floating point. And for the other uh, boards, obviously, there's differences between the bootloaders. But yeah, and, uh, if you want to build a generic binary thing, you just have to uh, settle on a uh, particular set of minimal features you need the board to have. Thank you. Um, I wonder whether you are encouraging bad behavior if you are willing to boot any uh, or build any random tree or branch. Um, you know, you mentioned that some vendors are not very good at upstreaming their code. Um, one way to get them to upstream it is to, uh, you know, not include them in distributions if they don't. <laughs> yeah, but I think that sort of thing is uh, something the big distributions can do, but, uh, but a smaller distribution cannot really uh, exert that sort of pr uh, pressure on an SOC vendor because they will just say, okay, the, uh, supporting that distribution would give us like five extra users, forget about it. So uh, we are actually uh, trying to do the, what will get the hardware supported and therefore also allow custom kernels and per board kernels. But obviously, it would be nice if the vendors just started doing the right thing and upstreamed everything. It would be really nice to get to a place where we can just have one kernel for everything. <laughs> Anything else? Is it? No, I guess. Since we still have a bit of time, we can take a look at uh, what the script does. Maybe the most interesting part is the, um, 
this line. The, uh, this specifies uh, what packages are going to be built in what order. So for example, first uh, we built the libc, which is already, the, uh, as I've mentioned before, variables. Uh, so this can be expanded to glibc or muscle or uclibc. Then it's n curses, and uh, this is the syntax we introduced here to, uh, to disable particular features. So this passes dash dash without C++ to RPM build. Then read line bash make ninja and all those packages in order. There you will see a few more that have circular dependencies. Like initially we have to build curl without GNU TLS and bad TLS. Yeah, and it's essentially just a list of 100 packages or so that, uh, that we need to get to a point where we can boot and uh, build the remaining packages on the target system. Okay, is there? Where is the native compiler in that list? It yeah, it's included in the list closer to the end. So for example, make is here almost in the beginning because it doesn't have any de uh, other dependencies. And the native compiler is somewhere closer to the end. Um, yeah. And another thing uh, worth pointing out there is, I've mentioned before that we have all this thing where the cross compilers are built as uh, sub packages and for the sake of the compile time, the, we leave that out here while we are building that initial bootstrap system. So as you can see, the compiler is somewhere in the middle, mm -hmm. uh, not quite at the end, because there's some more things that have even more dependencies. Like if you want to build a full-fledged version of Vim, you, uh, you also have to have some X libraries and the likes. And of course, we uh, want the system to be at least partially usable. <laughs> Yes, so. Sorry. The, uh, <laughs> I the uh, okay, I guess I'll just, uh, for the recording, I'll just repeat the uh, quick context, which was um, what's the uh, debugging a build failure like? Uh, can we res uh, resume or do we have to build the entire thing again? And the idea there is we can resume because we are just using the uh, packages as this route. We can always uh, directly change route into it and uh, run stuff from there. And if you look at what the script does, it essentially just runs RPM build on everything. And we also have a specific script build package that just builds one package. So if there's constantly a problem with one package, you can just uh, use build package on that and then uh, resume it. And yeah, also since the packages are always built in the same order, um, we have the command line option here, dash R, and then you give it the last package that succeeded, and then it uh, starts building just there. And of course, um, while it's running, it uh, creates log files everywhere. Output of RPM build is always redirected to, uh, to a log file uh, so you can look at it later even if you, uh, you just need to see if there were any warnings or so. So this is the script that's being used to build the packages. Yeah. Yeah, so it puts it all on standard output and also into build log. Okay. Do we have anything else? No, I guess not. So. What are your dogs' <laughs> names? <laughs> no, this is Guido. This is Laska. 
And given we have enough time, uh, maybe Guido can do his talk about chasing a cat on a tree and keeping it there after all. <laughs> <laughs> Good dog. <laughs>